Hello from Provincetown on beautiful Cape Cod, the home of Brodo's third annual uh, conference about art, climate, and science. Uh, my name is Ian Edwards and I'm the producer of the event. Uh, we're here on the beach, uh, looking way out there uh, toward Cape Cod and the rest of, uh, and the rest of Cape Cod. Um, 400 years ago, the first European settlers came ashore here looking for a better life. I think, yes, it's a complicated and difficult history for the Wampanoag people who have lived here for 12,000 years, so let's recognize that and their very long-term connection to this region. The long view, the long time horizon, it's really missing in our sustainability strategies. If government and businesses can't offer insights into building for a future uh, that doesn't include us, uh, maybe art and science can offer some insights. So this panel is selling long-termism and is an attempt to make long-termism more relevant today uh, from, art, from an art and science perspective. So it features Peter Tareem, who's a 25-year veteran in sustainability and is currently um, Vice President of Social Purpose and Stakeholder Engagement at the BC Lottery Corp Corporation. Uh, behavior science uh, scientist Dr. Amy Buecher is uh, Vice President of Behavior Design at MADPOW and it has a new book called Engage, Designing uh, for Behavior Change. Julia Buntain Howell is a conceptual artist and founding executive director from the SciArt Initiative. Uh, and one of the, um, and her polymath background includes uh, both neuroscience and fine art. Uh, Etienne White is the moderator for this, pan uh, this panel and she's a strategist and a writer and a coach and the vice president of brands uh, brands for good at Sustainable Brands. Uh, we hope you find this and our other Broda 2020 sessions an inspiration for a world made more sustainable. Now on with the session, Selling Long-Termism. Hi everyone, I'm so glad that we are all here today, gathered virtually, to have this conversation. And I'm delighted to to uh, hear from you on, on the topic that we're discussing today. So the topic is all about long-termism and how can art and science work together to help us um, in the field of sustainability really adopt long-termism and that approach almost as a default over more short-term um, solutions and approaches that we might be taking. So I wonder, just to kick us off then, um, if we could just hear from each of you on this question, how can we harness art and science to help make long-termism more relevant to solving our sustainability challenges? And I know that's a really big, broad question to start with, but I'd love to just kind of get an overview from you guys and maybe dive in deep on some of it too. Julia, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I will, yeah, and I, um, I'm not going to start with talking about 100 years from now, I'm going to start with talking about, you know, what, what we can do to make the next three years of art and science working together um, happen better. Um, so there's more and more of this is happening, but art can really be harnessed in a way that um, it's not harnessed very well right now, which is through the granting agencies of science. Um, this is increasingly happening where scientists find creative ways because scientists are some of the most creative people on the planet to write in artists on their grants that are for researching climate change or sustainability or new energy sources. Um, write, so for all the scientists out there, I just want to say, find a way to write an artist in on your grant, um, put them as a line item in your budget so they are paid just like anyone else who works on a study is paid. Um, and that's a way that at least, you know, is a meaningful um, partnership that can lead to the foundation of a really strong relationship between art and science in the context of climate change, you know, solutions. Um, so the National Science Foundation, they already have grants which support art and science working together. This is called Advances in Informal Science, science Learning. Um, so this is a really good grant to look into if you're interested in doing research, but you're also interested in informing um, informal science learning. You can partner with the arts to do this. So this is kind of just starting out public announcement. Like this is one tactic you can take. Um, but but um, 
Yeah, so that's a short-term thing, but maybe this is something we could really start to do now. If scientists start to focus on doing this right now, then in 100 years, and 200 years, that will be the norm. <laughs> so looking for that uh, long-term future of this kind of uh, energy and partnership. I'll add to um, I'll add to what Julia said there um, in terms of you know I think one of the problems with with sustainability behaviors or trying to engage more people around them is that um, a lot of environmentalists or environmental communications has been very finger wagging kind of judgy um, it puts a lot of people kind of you know in a defensive mode because they feel like they're being attacked and in fact they're not being attacked. Um, at a personal level, but that's how they interpret it. And so I think one of the things, um, you know, there's there's a, there's a science dimension to this, which is the behavior change side, um, and there's an art perspective to this, which I think is, you know, how do we uh, uh, enroll people in kind of what the future can look like. So I think um, one of the things that art and science can do is to work together to better describe or paint what, what a sustainable future looks like in a way that people from all kinds of different value sets can uh, identify. So we might have to have multiple narratives because there are different people, of course, different groups of people in society with different value sets. But storytelling, which we'll talk about later, I think, in this uh, session, is really critical. Uh, art can help uh, illustrate sort of uh, what that future can, can look like. And scientists can inform that as well in terms of uh, you know, what the future can look like if we take action or if we don't take action. So um, I think it's really important that we uh, look to people's values and try and connect with them where they're at and show them a pathway forward rather than just admonish them or make them feel guilty and hope that that's somehow going to shift people to the behaviors that we want. Yeah, that's a, a great segue as well to what the science tells us about the way that our brains work which is that they really aren't suited to long-termism out of the box. There's a model called the dual process model of cognition. It's the basis of behavioral economics, if you're familiar with the book Nudge or any of the work that's come out of that school of thought. And the basic idea is that we have two systems operating simultaneously in our brains. So one of them, system one, is the fast brain. And that's the brain that responds immediately when we encounter something in the environment. So it's raw emotional responses to things and um you know we our, our second system system two the the slower brain the more cognitive brain essentially is trailing along behind the fast brain trying to generate logical reasons why we should go with our gut why we should do what we feel and what that means is that art has a really powerful role to play in eliciting emotional responses and telling a story in a way that gets that first knee-jerk response to be the one that is also uh, congruent with sustainability behaviors. There's, um, you know, we, we tend to think of our future selves in this very abstract way, almost like it's a totally different person than ourselves today. And so we make plans for our future selves that we would never agree to for our current day selves. One of the big challenges in behavior change science is how do we close that gap between action and intention? And one of the ways that we do it is by making that future less abstract, more concrete. And again, I think that's really where art and artists can play a role in partnership with science to bring the future forward. That's great, thank you. I already am feeling such rich um, dialogue and perspectives from you. Um, I feel like we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the moment we're in right now. We are all calling in from home offices and we're not meeting in person. Um, and so there is a, a crisis right now that collectively as a culture we are experiencing together. How, um, how do you see uh, because there are some really great behaviors going on right now. From a behavior change perspective, we're not being nudged, we're kind of being shoved and pushed in some ways into, I know, the nudging theory was really nice and now we have, you know, lockdown, right? Um, and so we're being, um, you know, kind of um, forced in some ways into adopting new routines, into adopting a new lifestyle. And with that come many really great behavior changes. Um, in my field of work, we've narrowed it down to nine critical behaviors um, that are needed to to help us mitigate against the climate crisis 
that we'll be in um, in a decade's time if we don't act now. And many of those critical behaviors are being adopted already. Um, and so one of the questions I have for you is what can art do and what can science do, whether it's together or separately on kind of parallel paths, to help sustain those good changes, to help celebrate um, the transformation that we are taking now um, and the really great behaviors that we're adopting. And maybe if you could speak about some of those um, good behavior changes that we're seeing too, that'd be great. Well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in <clears throat> first. Um, I think some ways that we can sustain these behaviors, one is rewards and recognition. Um, you know, humans like to be rewarded. They like to be recognized. We don't do everything for ego or, or, for, or, or for that reason, but it's nice to, um, to be recognized and celebrated. So companies and governments, and we as individuals, uh, need to be calling out the good behaviors that, you know, that we've been seeing um, with COVID, but also, also good behaviors that we see when people are adopting a sort of a, a lower carbon uh, lifestyle. Um, you know, celebrating people who are eating less meat or who are deciding less to, uh, to, to travel less or what have you. Um, I think uh, also focusing on this idea of transferability, showing how the behaviors that people have adopted today during the COVID crisis can also help address the climate crisis. Uh, there's a lot of parallels between the two worlds, and I think if we help uh, people understand or bridge that, those two worlds, I think, um, you know, and art can play a great role in doing that. Um, and, and, you know, I think the science art discussion is about head and heart, right? And so, mm -hmm. so they each play a role there. And I think um, a third point is, is, is the whole idea of agency and, and focusing on how our collective action and the individual decisions that we've all made um, have power to make change. And, you know, the, 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 the flatten the curve kind of language um, is, is a bit about that. Um, because it, it says, you know, do your part and you will flatten the curve and, and then people can see that their actions actually add up. And so feeding that kind of um, intelligence back to people, uh, letting them see how their behaviors are reducing, uh, you know, the, uh, the carbon benefits of eating meat three times, you know, not eating meat, let's say three times a week or of, of not traveling internationally or what have you. All of these things, I think, are, are, are ways that, that we can help, hopefully, ingrain some more of the, the, the behaviors that people have been um, experiencing with, with COVID-19. I think that it's actually to our advantage in sustaining some of these behaviors that they have been forced upon us for you know, a significant period of time, weeks if not more. And we don't know how long um, you know, the social distancing policies will last, but the indication is that it will be quite some time. A lot of behavior change has to do with making short-term sacrifices, decisions that are not the most pleasurable ones in the moment. So if you think about somebody who's trying to lose weight, for example, they uh, you know, may not be able to have the food that is most delicious or appealing to them in the moment. Instead, they're choosing something that's lower calorie or an exercise routine, you know, it can be very physically uncomfortable to begin an exercise routine and have that muscle soreness and the lack of confidence around these new behaviors. Once people get over that hump, once they discover ways to make the new behavior more pleasurable, and in some cases it's, it's really a physical negative response that the body just needs to adapt to, they become easier to maintain. And I think during this social isolation period, we are finding that some behaviors that looked really uncomfortable on paper, maybe were really uncomfortable to start to adopt, we're figuring out how to do them in a way that works for us. And so in those cases, I think that we will see that it's much easier to make them part of the repertoire moving forward. Um, we are very pleasure oriented as a species. There's some research that I think is really interesting around the way menus are written in restaurants. And they find that people are more likely to order a vegetarian entree when it's described with the same sort of really flowery, rich language that we can use with meat-based entrees. So it's not that people are rejecting vegetarian meals per se, it's that they're, um, they're not being drawn in, it's not being presented to them in as appealing a manner. And when you start to create these foods that are you know, plant-based, but also really described in this gourmet type of way and you know, plated to look really beautiful, People are willing to do that because that is appealing to their senses. It's appealing to their sense of pleasure. And so I think we have this opportunity here to take some really good sustainability behaviors and kind of use this forced period to get over that hump of making them feel more comfortable and more, more pleasurable. I was just going to uh, 
agree with my fellow panelists and <laughs> I, I really I think one behavior which is really prevalent now that a lot of people have rapidly adopted is being conscientious you know that's what social distancing is for the majority of people out there most of us are not sick but we wear masks when we go out um, not because we're necessarily you know think we're going to spread anything but because we don't want to spread anything um, if we see somebody else and pick it up accidentally you know it, so it's, it really is about being conscientious and that is an easily transferable um, kind of conceptual skill <laughs> that could be put towards climate change and sustainability and you know like Peter was saying there has to be some sort of reward system for that it's it and social reward is really really valuable um you know social reward that comes through like likes on facebook you know whether we like that or not that actually has a lot of capital um and so figuring out ways to celebrate and kind of you know give people a thumbs up right um that's i, I think that's something we could really take a lesson from here yeah, if I can share something, this is kind of hot off the presses, but there's a group of behavior scientists that I'm connected with who just piloted a small study. They put together a stand against Corona pledge, and it's just four um, behaviors they're asking people to engage in. So maintaining your distance, washing your hands, um, et cetera. And they tested different messaging online, and they found that, um, so one was just generic, take the stand against Corona. One was take it for yourself, for your own safety and well-being. And then one was to protect the others around you. And they found that that one about doing it for yourself really performed badly. It was the only one that was statistically different from the others. Um, that self-interest didn't seem to drive behavior change nearly as much as even the generic message. And I think that says something about how social we are and how much we really do care about um, you know, both taking care of other people, but also being recognized by other people for the good things that we do. That's fantastic and actually segues really nicely into my next question. I was going to ask, you know, in this time we've seen incredible acts of kindness happening everywhere from the small um, to the large and it feels like altruism has become a lot more popular in our culture. It's kind of trending um, alongside the, the COVID crisis and I wondered if you guys could speak to that a little bit. Where does altruism come from? Where within us does it sit and again what can we do coming out of this to help ourselves collectively as a, as a culture think about embedding that for the long term and it not just being this um, short-term blip at a time of crisis how can we think in a long-term way um, about maintaining this this strong altruism trend that we're seeing yeah, for, for an evolutionary psychology they, they consider altruism as a, a gene protection so um, the idea being that you would help others if they were genetically related to you because that continues your family line. And of course, you know, we live in much different types of family and community structures now as, um, you know, the evolutionary psychology science looks at. But um, one thing that the modern psychological science does find is that when you create a feeling of kinship between people, then they feel an urge to extend this empathy. They feel this, um, you know, what happens to you is what happens to me. And so there's all sorts of things that they've done in the research to create those deep senses of empathy, um, whether it's taking the perspective of somebody else very deliberately. So, you know, maybe writing a journal entry from the perspective of somebody else but also story. So watching an interview with somebody, having a conversation directly with somebody, reading a work of fiction that presents somebody else's reality in a way that really um, stirs the emotion, all of those things can create that sense of empathy and that sense of um, you know, familiar familiarity, that we are part of the same unit and that it's really important to me and my well-being to include you in my sense of who I protect. So I think that's where the art and science come together because we know a lot from a science perspective about how empathy stokes altruism. And I think art is one of the primary vehicles through which we can arouse those sorts of emotional responses in people and create that sense of relationship and connectedness between different groups. Yeah, Julie, I'd love to hear from you about art and its power to connect people then or art and its power to um, draw empathy and create empathy between between people um, as that then pertains to altruism. That'd be really interesting to hear from you on that. 
Certainly, yeah. Um, as I was uh, thinking about this question, the piece um, Pad Thai by Rurkrit Taranavin came to mind. So this was a piece, is a performance art piece that was done in the 1990s first, and then he's redone it a bunch of times since then around the world. Uh, but it was first done at the Paula Allen Gallery in New York. And um, this was when relational aesthetics was being explored in the art world uh, for the first time. Um, of course, art is such now that every form of art is being explored. There's no kind of, you know, singular overarching um, style or, or concept, um, which maybe is a style and concept in itself, but that's for another panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this, this piece called Pad Thai, um, the artist cooked and served Pad Thai to the gallery visitors. That's what the piece was. And this was the first time that somebody had done something like this in such a kind of public way at a very renowned New York gallery. Um, you couldn't buy this piece, um, obviously, for the gallery with some sort of investment uh, monetarily on their part, because galleries have to make money on a monthly basis from the artists they exhibit in order to exist. Uh, so it was very bold in, in a number of ways from all parties involved. Um, but I think that, you know, for the attendees, you can imagine, you know, how lovely it is when you go to your friend's house and they cook you dinner, uh, but this is a stranger cooking dinner for you, and you're with a bunch of other strangers eating, and it's sort of this community feeling and vibe starts to happen. Um, and I think, you know, more experiences like that, you know, the, the best way to really learn something is to embody it, right? So whether you're the giver or the person attending, you're experiencing what it is um, to have to have this togetherness that's not prompted by anything. It's just somebody deciding to do this and, and people show up. And there's something, you know, really special about that. Um, what does the artist get in return? They, they get the pleasure of seeing people enjoying food <laughs> and that's worth something to them. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's where my mind is kind of going with altruism and with, you know, how can we actually... Um, how can we involve people in experiences that stick with them to speak to long-termism? Um, I really think embodied experiences are the only way to do that. It's so easy to see, you know, charts and graphs and headlines, and they all just kind of blur together, and then it gets replaced by, you know, the next Netflix show you watch. Um, <laughs> we're all, you know, we all suffer from a bombardment of information, but to have an actual experience to embody something, and then maybe in turn, you know, you're the next artist who's serving food from a gallery. Um, that's the kind of thing that I'd like to see more of and, and could maybe kind of you know, make its way into this conversation. Love that example because it really is a, a, a blending of both an act of altruism and a redefinition of what people's perception of art might be, right? And so it's really provocative yeah. and, and, and demonstrative too in that sense. Peter, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Amy talked about this, this, this sort of genetic component to altruism, and, and that's true. Uh, you know, scientists think that uh, altruism is, is one way to kind of preserve, right, the species, and, and that we do that of a certain amount of self-interest. That said, uh, you know, I, I think everybody has some empathy, uh, but it, it, it depends on the, on, on the person as to how empathic they are. Um, the good thing is that the, that empathy and, and altruism release endorphins and make you feel good. And so mm -hmm. if we can unlock that for people, uh, art is a great way of doing that. Uh, so is, uh, you know, and, and science can sort of uh, instruct us maybe on, on, on beneficial ways of doing that through art. Um, that's really critical. I, I think of a program called Roots of Empathy, um, which is about taking, uh, I don't know if it exists in your communities, but... Um, it, 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 I've, I've been exposed to it here in Vancouver where a mother with a newborn will come into a classroom every couple of weeks and show the class how the baby is developing and growing up. And the idea of that is to connect children to child development, to another human being, to the wonder of life, and those sorts of things. And although, you know, you could call that a form of art, um, quite frankly, and I think what we also have to do is we have to actively foster and develop empathy in people. We can't just assume it's going to be there. And fortunately, there is a positive feedback loop, as I said, because those endorphins, you know, that feeling of, hey, I just helped that person, that good Samaritan feeling, I think is, is, is something that almost anybody can, you know, uh, enjoy or get something out of. 
So, um, you know, altruism, I think, is innate within us, but I think we can also do more to foster it. That's fantastic. Thank you, guys. We talked um, briefly about storytelling, and I wonder if we could just take a couple of minutes to do a deeper dive on stories. You know, we have the data and we have the science around all the things we should be doing um, to adopt more sustainable lifestyles. Unfortunately, we have the, the, the awful data that shows the trajectory we're on, right? And so what can art do to help science tell the story in a way that's going to be motivating um, and especially in a way that's not going to scare because we know that people get overwhelmed by the bad news to a point of almost paralysis and then beyond paralysis can go to you know not thinking that anything they do um, is going to matter it's just one extra long shower it's just one plastic straw it's just one it's just one um, and so you know without putting too much on the shoulders of art what role is there for art to help science tell that story and um, and Amy I'd love to hear from you you know what can science be doing better to tell its story of, of data and science well, science can be doing a lot better. <laughs> uh, I think that, and I, I'll even speak for myself as a behavior scientist. We are really trained in what I sometimes call the gray area, all of the nuance and the it depends, and we'd have to do the research on the, and you know, again, that's not how the human brain is really programmed to think. There's a reason that it takes a long time to train a scientist to think that way. And I think we do need to get better at communicating things in a more straightforward fashion that resonates with the way that people actually talk and think. Um, I do see art as being a really powerful partner in that, whether it's something like um, you know, helping with data visualization. There's um, now what I really consider a hybrid art science role for a data visualization specialist in a lot of companies. And part of what they're doing is they're telling the story of science through art um, in a way that people can understand that resonates with them. And there's just such an incredible role for that. As a behavior scientist, I also focus a lot on motivation. And one of the drivers of motivation is this sense that the things that we do matter, that they're adding mm. up to some kind of result. And again, art has a role in showing us what that result might look like, whether it is a story from you know somebody elsewhere in the world who's affected by some of the decisions that we make in our consumption in the way that we interact with the world, or whether it's something like the photography that we've seen recently um, in social isolation as there's less traffic on the roads. Um, there's been beautiful images from around the world of you know, wildlife returning to areas that have been urbanized, um, pollution that's visibly receding. Those sorts of things I find really hopeful and I think they feed into that motivational drive of knowing that the decisions we're making in our households might be contributing to something bigger in the world. Um, so, I, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Amy. It's, it's been amazing to see those photos. I've also been following them. And also just to see, you know, out, out the front yard, it's like all these things that haven't been there before. Um, and, and it makes you, you know, realize, oh, yeah, we're not the only people here. People. Uh, we're not the only people here who live here. So, in thinking about stories, um, I couldn't help but think of the example of, um, I'm looking at my notes here, Brandon Stanton. So he is the human behind Humans of New York, which is a kind of viral social media phenomenon. Um, and I think he's a really fantastic example of the method and platform through which messages can be widely um, put out there. And they're, they're personal messages. So for those of you who aren't familiar with, you know, speaking to the audience, for those of you who aren't familiar with Humans of New York, it's basically, a Facebook page. They have a website, but the main thrust of it is the Facebook page and their Instagram. Um, their Facebook has 18 million likes. That's a ton. <laughs> um, their Instagram has 10 million followers. You know, that's way more than most politicians. Um, and the book that he put out is a New York Times number one bestseller. You know, this guy has really got onto something, and all he does is take a picture of a person. It doesn't even have to be their face. It can be their hands or their foot if they wish to remain anonymous. And he tells their story. He lets them tell their story and he quotes them. And I'll tell you, like every single story that you read, they're, they're tear jerkers or they're, you know, smile givers. They are like something so emotional and so impactful. And all of a sudden, you really care about this other human being you're never going to meet 
for like one second. And some stories really stick with you. They stick with you forever. And you know, how did he do this? He did this on social media. Like scientists and artists, you know, the way that we're going to get these messages out there is through this platform, which we, you know, might use, but don't really like that much. Haven't figured out how to optimize on because we're fighting algorithms. Um, <laughs> same with YouTube, you know, they're, these are very, very powerful things. And the people like Brandon who have figured out how to use them and use them well through the type of content he delivers, but also his frequency of delivery, you know, um, he gets people to raise money for an orphanage in Uganda. He raised, what is it, $200,000 in 18 hours for an orphanage um, all the way across the world from most of the people who gave to it. And, you know, so he makes you care about him. He makes you care about the people he features. So why can't we have an artist figure out how to do this for climate and sustainability things? You know, there, there must be a way. And it takes a very special kind of artist, for sure. Not everyone's capable of that. Um, but I think it comes down to, you know, being humble, which he is. And it comes down to having content, which is not... Um, it's not just kind of summed up stuff from stuff that everyone's heard of already. It's it's real stuff that's you know individual and specific and unique and powerful for that reason because of its authenticity. Great. So, so add, yeah, oh, I was just going to add no, go ahead. to this from a storytelling perspective for a moment. I mean, you know, storytelling is as old as human civilization, quite frankly, and and we, and we've used it to you know set direction or create understanding, galvanize people, control people. Mm -hmm. um, Right? We tap into people's spirit, their emotions, their, their imagination um, in a way that can build a shared understanding or shared meaning. And religion, quite frankly, is a great example of awesome storytelling and uniting people around certain principles, right? And stories, um, you know, once told are, and well told are, are, are really viral. And whether that's a painting or whether that's a, um, uh, a performance art piece or, or what have you, if we create ways for the audience to see themselves in the story, and this is where this long-termism comes in, then I think we do a, then storytelling is really being effective. I'm just going to use that to cross promote another session that I'm not at all involved in, but it's called cathedral thinking. Um, and it's part of this uh, Brodo this year. And the idea behind that uh, in terms of long-termism is in the days of people building cathedrals in the middle ages, you know, you worked on that a project like that for maybe 20, 30 years, and you never saw it finish. But you knew that you were part of something bigger, and there was like a dream, and there was a vision behind it. And I think that's the kind of um, principles that we need to draw from when it comes to uh, exciting people about the future, about giving them a longer-term perspective, and helping them feel like they're part of something bigger. I, I liked very much the examples that we've given here. What about Banksy? I mean, he's a pretty good artist um, for the climate right now. Um, is the role of art to um, make us feel warm and special and welcome like the Pad Thai? Or is the role of art when we're thinking long-termism and achieving sustainability's you know, goals, is the role of art to provoke us? Where, where, where do we sit on that spectrum? Is it all of the above or just somewhere? I would say both. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so we want it all. Of course we do. Yeah, no, um, we, need, we need to be jolted out of complacency. That's where the provocation comes in. So, so we need people to create that sense of discomfort. That's what causes change. But then when we're on the right track, we need that reassurance, that warmth, you know, the cheerleader. So I, I think you really do need both. It's where there's a, a gap between what people, we want people to be doing what they're actually doing. That's where we provoke. And then once we uh, have them, you know, moving on a sustainable path, we congratulate. That's fabulous. Thank you. One last question, um, and we have to be brief so that we don't run out of time. Um, I'm conscious that we're all white people on this call. I'm glad that um, women outweigh the men. Sorry about that, Peter. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, the future, the long-termism uh, that we're looking at here and, and the, the goals that we have to achieve to move through the climate crisis do also include as equally important as the environmental piece, social pieces and fostering 
inclusive and resilient societies uh, where multiple populations are represented is really important. And so just recognizing that we don't have, uh, you know, everyone that should probably be at this table, although we're at a virtual table today, um, with us. And what, what should we do uh, to bring everybody to the table so that everyone is able to give the inputs as we're solving um, these great challenges of our lifetime? Well, you know, we have to reduce the barriers to people participating, and that's the challenge, right? And and a lot of those barriers are economic. Um, there's a uh, and 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 um, you know, there's a huge social justice issue, uh, both with the COVID uh, situation as well as with uh, climate change. That people who are more you know, are more vulnerable and marginalized and so on, um, they don't have the ability. They're not even invited uh, to, to the table. And quite frankly. Um, society still hasn't fully acknowledged that those inequalities and barriers exist. Uh, we live in a period of the greatest income inequality I think that we've seen in the last at least century probably. Um, and until we acknowledge that issue, and I think we are starting to, the COVID situation has drawn more attention to that, until we all acknowledge that that is actually a problem and that our way out of, or our way um, through a solution to the climate crisis is by having everybody participate, uh, we're not going to make any progress. And I think, you know, we need good social policy, we need good economic policy, we need good corporate behavior, we need a range of things in order for us to ensure that we create that more level playing field and more points of access into the conversation that exists currently. Yes. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, in my role as a behavior change scientist, I do a lot of primary research with people. so. A lot of interviews and um, design sessions to try to understand uh, a design challenge from people's perspective but one of the tools that we use and I think that it has a role here in making sure that you know more people are at the table when we think about sustainability is participatory design so it's not just us going and doing an interview and then saying this is the way things are and here's the solution we propose it's actually inviting the people who that solution is for to be co-designers with us and so we will have, um, you know, we'll spend a full day with a group of people and really structure activities to get them involved in designing the solution. And what we find is, first of all, you know, they bring a creativity and an intimacy with the problem space that we could not replicate. So the quality of the output is better, but it also means that it's, it's appropriate for that group of people. It's something that they want, that they welcome, that fits what they're their needs are. And I think that we really need to make that effort to reach out and bring folks to the table, um, you know, let, letting them know that they're not just welcome, but necessary. That seems so obvious and yet so commendable at the same time. Um, and also listening to what Peter said about poverty and obviously the fault lines there are that, you know, um, race and gender inequality are also within that within that poverty line that, that, that Peter talks about. Um, and so, Julia, what role does art have in helping us bring everyone to the table? I think there's a definite role there. Um, what what Amy was just talking about, you know, in my mind, that's a lot like citizen science. Um, mm -hmm. Citizen science is a way for science to extend its reach to get to areas that they're unable to get to, to make data sets larger than they'd be able to make on their own, you know, within their small team. But if you're going to take that idea and go further with it, um, maybe there's something called citizen innovation. You know, maybe there's an idea where a large mass of people who are just citizens of, you know, wherever they happen to be or be from, who they are, et cetera, whichever way you want to slice it up, um, there's a way to have participatory input. And certainly the idea of participatory input is not new in art. Um, in fact, some artists would, and art historians would tell you that you know, the art object doesn't exist until somebody interacts with it. Um, so there's there's that idea, but but really, you know, for for artists, the great thing about art is that, you know, we don't need permission to do anything. We just go out and do it. Um, we don't need a funding agency to approve us. We don't need IRBs. Um, we don't, you know, really need any of those things. Some of those things are helpful. Um, but, but yeah, an artist could, could go out and, and create a collective performance artwork that addresses sustainability and climate uh, change, and the output of it is some sort of solution. You know, that is something that art could do any day now, and 
you know, some artists are working in this area on smaller scales, but I'd like to see it on the scale of these citizen science projects, which, you know, engage hundreds of thousands of people, right, for worldwide. And why not do it through platforms like Zoom and these other web things now that we're all used to them and know how to use them. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. One more point on this topic. You know, this kind of reminds me of discussions around diversity and inclusion as well, right? And, and you, you acknowledge that at, at the beginning in terms of the, the composition of this um, panel. Um, and I think we often view these things as like a checkbox exercise. Okay, have we got the person of color? Have we got the LGBTQ person? Have we got the lawyer or whatever? That's only part of it. We also have to look at the way that we actually engage people. Like so, some people come from cultures where authority is something that you fear. And so a facilitator is somebody who actually is not a friendly person. They're, they might be a scary person. Or it might be the way that we invite um, people to speak their voice. It might be the process itself. Like we have to think about the whole system, not just a checkbox of making sure that we have the diversity at the table, but also just creating various modalities that can also um, allow people of varying backgrounds to feel comfortable that they can give good input and that they're um, and that they can do so free of, um, of consequence or retribution or what have you because we apply our, our Western sort of thinking to this but uh, climate change is a global problem and we have to be thinking in a multiplicity of cultural contexts. That is a fantastic point to end on, Peter. Thank you so much. What a, what a grand um, finale to this great conversation that we've had. I have been so heartened throughout this conversation. Obviously, we've been talking about long-termism, and even as a moderator, that sounds a little bit um, intimidating, if you like. I don't, you know, the long-term. And there's so much that you've talked about today that has shown that there are immediate, actionable, demonstrable things that we can be doing today that are going to help us achieve those long-term objectives and help embed long-termism into our thinking. And so that gives me so much heart. Um, I'm so honored to have been in conversation with you today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hi. Since we've recorded that, you guys, um, even just in a matter of weeks, the, the world has changed in so many ways. Are there any extra thoughts that came to you before we dive into the Q&A here that you um, are burning to, to share with us? No burning. Okay. No. Um, let's look at the questions that we have here then. So, um, how do we bring future generations to the table? Is it by proxy? Is it by messaging? Um, there's a worry that our long-termism concerns are focused on the wrong audience. Peter, what do you what do you think about that? How do we bring future generations to the table? Um, well, yeah, I guess um, if I if I understand the the uh, question correctly, it's saying that you know our long term our long-termism concerns are focused on the wrong audience. In other words, they're focused on us. It's not focused on 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 the future. Um, you know, I think our, our session talked about a number of different ways to, to uh, try and do that. Um, you know, I, uh, a lot of this is just um, thinking of the kind of legacy that we individually want to leave uh, in the world, you know, and I think we all do have a desire for meaning and purpose. Um, and some of this is sort of appealing, you know, even though, uh, the benefit is in the future. We, we still do need to appeal to people today because it's their behavior that we need to change. So, yeah, and I think yeah. this is come in the form of education. Um, a lot of educators are moving from STEM to STEAM. Um, you can't just teach people about science, you have to teach people about how science impacts personal lives and, and culture and emotions and stories that's where the a comes in the arts you know plus fine um steam is an insufficient acronym but that is essentially its goal is to is to put put the arts in in place with science and technology at the same table so that they're all within the context of each other um hopefully that will lead to young individuals who grow up to to really carry on 
you know, the things which we're talking about right now. Um, so that's one way to, it's, it's not really bringing younger generations to the table to this conversation, but it, it's allowing them to continue our conversation, you know, when we're not here anymore. Yeah, I, I think that I, actually, I don't know, know, Amy, I'd love to hear your, yeah, go ahead. I don't know that we need to um, make a special point of it. I think the younger generations are coming to the table whether we invite them or not, because with the passage of time, uh, you know, it seems like the consequences of climate change, the effects of it are, you know, it's accelerating. It's more visible now than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So young people today are growing up with an awareness of how, how very pressing this issue is and an expectation that they're going to need to make changes and be activists in order to get to a better result. And I think that's a reason why we're seeing a lot of leadership from even teenagers in some of the sustainability efforts. So, um, you know, I think in some, in some ways it's asking them how we can better serve the cause that, um, you know, is going to impact their generation even more than ours. Yes, I completely agree. I feel like the kids are all right. Uh, yeah. There's Greta and many others that are leading that charge. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos is about to become a trillionaire. Um, so I feel like there's still a lot that can be done with the existing generations. And unfortunately, those future generations are already seeing what's coming um, and are already um, activating as they need to. Um, what about, there's a question here of what are your thoughts on how art and science are displayed and what formats are powerful in terms of influencing behavior? Um, you know, should the, what, should the art um, need a story to go along with it or would the art suggest that the answer um, lies within it and shouldn't, shouldn't have further explanation? You guys got any thoughts around those areas? Yeah, I saw this Julia? question and I, you know, this is the question, this is not the first time this question has been asked. It's been asked in every critique, in every art class, for every artist. What is the purpose of your work? What is the motivation of your work? What are you trying to do with your work? And then from there you have the answer. So if we're talking about a scenario where we want work to be made that has an impact on people's mindset about our planet, about climate change, about our energy sources, about sustainability efforts, I'm going to say, yeah, there needs to be some information conveyed there. The work needs to be um, somehow, uh, I, it does not have to be explicit. You know, you can have a spiritual awakening by looking at a Rothko painting. And that's not because there's a little text on the side that tells you how to feel about it. That's because he is an expert and created an experience for you. And he knew he was doing that. So there can be climate change art like that if you're the right kind of artist. But if you're looking to talk to somebody about rising water levels or, you know, other very specific issues, um, yes, art is a carrier of messages. It is a conveyor of information. Mm -hmm. It's conveyed in form, material, scale, color. Uh, these are all tools. Um, and, you know, artwork can be accompanied by a text that's acceptable now, <laughs> uh, didn't used to be. And, and that's, you know, on the kind of conceptual side of things. And, and that's often those pieces are what, you know, get people learning like, oh, I learned this, and then I'm going to dig into it on Wikipedia, then I'm going to talk to my friends about it. So there's definitely that potential there. And, you know, I, as an artist, I think artists can always and should always try be trying to do a better job at at conveying what whatever they should be in their work. It's not something you ever fully achieve. It's something you always aspire to. Can I? I am not an artist, so um, I, I don't necessarily feel qualified to respond to the art piece of it. But I do quite a bit of experience, strategy, and design in my work. And I think that there's also something to be said for creating the circumstances in which a person encounters a work of art so that some of those um, relevances are, are just made obvious by the situation. I mean, it could be something as explicit as designing an exhibit in a museum, but it could also be something like, you know, putting that, um, that piece of art that speaks to rising water levels in a place where there might be rising water levels. I, I really like the idea of considering the context with the art as a way to help communicate the message. 
I think you're totally right about that, Amy. It's, you know, you can, you can, uh, there's a reason that being a curator is a job. <laughs> that's, that's the person who designs the experience of the exhibit. Um, and, you know, if, if it's within, but that's, you know, part of the reason Frodo is in Provincetown and not in a town that's completely unaffected by things like the water, um, because these issues are just so much more palpable and, and the art, um, that, that would have been displayed uh, in Provincetown is now on Broda's website, so check it out. But but yeah, I, I think they would have had an impact there for that exact reason. The impact you know, could have been doubled um, just because of context. So it's really important to keep that in mind. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm looking at this next question and I'm pretty sure you guys can see it too, but it talks about the pleasures that some of us are discovering during this great time out or time in, um, but, but asks the question, what about the people who are in financial danger, who may lose their home if pro productivity is reduced um, and our economic system is transformed? How do we deal with injustice and with justifiable fear of change? Well, isn't that going to be um, our all of our work for the next several years? I mean, um, talking about long-termism, we are loading up now a society with debt as well. Uh, that is going to take a long time to pay off. Um, and, uh, I, you know, we quite frankly have had no choice. We, we, we've had to react in the way that, that, that we have. Um, but it, this is certainly not something that's just going to... Uh, you know, that we're just going to roll out of like, uh, you know, 9-11 happened and then, you know, the solution was go out and shop everybody. Um, this is not going to be that uh, kind of s s situation. And, and, and unfortunately, this is only going to further, I think, marginalize and, and make vulnerable people who were already living on the margin um, when it comes to climate change. Because these are the folks who are going to find themselves living in places that are going to be more and more uh, vulnerable to rising waters, uh, severe weather events, and that kind of thing. So unfortunately, this is, uh, this is only going to exacerbate, I think, the impacts of climate change. I see it a little bit differently, Peter. I, I love the etymology of the word crisis in the Greek root. It originally means to sift and separate. So it's like sieving. So when you're in crisis, everything else falls away and only the most important things are what's left. And I feel like what COVID is showing us is, uh, you know, we're seeing the environmental benefits of not traveling anymore, of not polluting our skies and our roadways anymore. More than 11,000 people, 11,000 lives have already been saved in the UK alone based on reduced air pollution. We're seeing that things like healthcare for all should be a human right. We're seeing that our racism, certainly in the US, speaking for the US here, is indeed systemic when we're looking at the, at the death rates and the infection rates amongst um, African-American, Hispanic communities for example. All those things are horrible, but COVID, I think, is kind of putting them right in front of us and revealing it to us in a way that hopefully it won't be ignored anymore. Amy, what, what, are you, what is your take on that? Yeah, I, I agree, actually. I think one of the potential positives to come out of this situation is that it's becoming a lot easier to see places where political activism might actually have a real effect. So I, I share Peter's concerns that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that this is, you know, it's going to disparately affect people who are already very vulnerable. Um, but I also think that that needs to be a warning to those of us who have more privilege that our advocacy is really important that um you know voting is not enough it's, it's really got to go beyond that and we've got to go try to push for those systemic changes that will protect vulnerable people uh, you know put sustainable policies into place and really um, try to take advantage of this moment for change that's great thank you julia do you have any thoughts not specifically to that. I think I yeah. think the world's going to change, and I think you know things like um, seventy-five thousand dollar a year college tuitions won't exist anymore because people will realize I don't need to pay that much to have an experience I can have online and an alternative, and that will open up doors for a lot of people that should have been opened a long time ago. 
That's a really great point. And actually, it kind of segues in. It's really nice to see how the questions lined up here, because one of the questions was actually uh, also financially related and specifically to artists. How do we get more money to artists that don't have um, the privileges that many practice or established artists already have? Um, so if we're looking at people of color, uh, female artists, lower income p potentially, um, how do we kind of remove some of those barriers that Peter was talking about that stop them coming to the table or being seen? And, and there are being seen. Well, there is an amazing number of grants right now for COVID relief for artists. So, you know, if you're an artist out there and you rely on the sale of your work for, you know, primary source of your income, look, look online. They are there. They're going fast, just like all of these, you know, kind of funds that come up are. But um, it's, it's been wonderful to see the very large nonprofits who fund the arts in our country um, and, and elsewhere to, to really turn turn their motivations around and, and figure out how to keep artists just, you know, going on right now. Um, so, so yeah, um, again, I think, you know, we've explored the internet more than ever in the last two months and its potential are, uh, you know, we can use this thing for good, this thing that we've created, which isn't always great. Uh, we can use it for good. And I think a lot more art will become web-based as a means to reach more people. And as a, you know, if, uh, if you don't have to buy a thousand dollars in paint to create something which a thousand people can see on the internet, um, so but it, it could be interesting. I'm always looking for the silver lining um, because uh, I have to. Um, so yeah, but that could be something. We see. That's great. I'm just looking on the chat and it looks about, uh, there's a question there, where to find more ongoing data about the positive results during this crisis? Oh, I, I, that one I came across myself, it was on the BBC, um, the one about 11,000 people surviving from reduced air pollution. I don't know of a single site that's listing and tracking it and absolutely would throw that back out to anyone who is um, here with us on the call. Please, if you've got, if you've got a good news site um, that specifically has the social and environmental good news that's related to COVID, um, let us know. And then switching back to um, Q&A, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and so I'm just going to look here and I see this question talking about coronavirus fatigue and also drawing the parallel with climate fatigue, which is a real thing. Um, so any thoughts, last thoughts you guys have on how to get past this aspect of our human nature? We, you know, being altruistic and kind and good and staying home for the greater good is hard and we get bored of it and antsy. Um, how do we how do we get over that? Amy, I might throw that to you first of all, if that's okay. Yeah, and I'm gonna apologize off the bat that I feel like I wish I had an answer to this because I've been so frustrated seeing it, um, you know, very much understand that it's real and why it happens as a behavior scientist, but as a human being and a you know, person who doesn't wanna see anyone get sick or, or suffer like that, I'm really frustrated with it. I do think that um, we need to look to some of the countries that have done a better job at really stopping the spread of coronavirus. That to me feels like a, a way to build hope around these really hard, um, you know, stay at home behaviors where you know, we, miss, we miss what we used to have. We miss seeing other people. As the weather turns nicer, it's really hard to think about not going to the beach or not walking on the beautiful crowded park pathway. But um, you know, we, we can draw hope by looking at some of the parts of the world where they've taken those actions and there has been an end. And I think that's really something we need to emphasize to people is that this does not have to be forever, but we need to buckle down in order to get to that end as quickly as possible. Great, Julia? Um, yeah, this, this is a tough one. I, I mean, I think we, we have to remember we're just on this planet for a little while, uh, but you know, the trees that live around us and, you know, the many animals that outlive us um, and the future generations that are coming after us, uh, remembering that we play a small but important part in this story of our planet, um, you know, might be a humbling mindset to take. Great, thank you. Peter, any last words for us? We just need to inject a little bit of fun also into all of it. <laughs>